Coming up on this week's show, we chat about the history of online gaming. We look at the most violent game on the Switch. And we chat Revolution Software with Charles Cecil. This week's show is brought to you by our friends at Beer52 and ExpressVPN. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour episode 245, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. Now this week, Joe, we have an absolutely amazing guest. This is Charles Cecil and he's the founder of Revolution Software. I know you did this interview, you did it solo and it ended up being, how long was it in the end? It was like two and a half hours before editing or something (laughs) mad like that, but like the only way I can describe it is like Ravi was just messaging me constantly like this guy this guy these stories man like so ah yeah what did Revolution do well Charles is absolutely fantastic Mm. so Charles started working at Arctic okay which was like a kind of a Britsoft thing you know they were creating their own games they were packaging themselves they were printing out the labels putting them in the plastic sheets (laughs) you know it's a real small operation above a fruit shop right and he kind of helped pioneer with this adventure titles and these adventure games. But what happened was he eventually started making point and clicks. And now you think the established point and click companies out there were like Lucasfilm games. Yeah. There were also Sierra, who we yeah. had Ken Williams on last week. Yeah. Well, kind of entering that space, it's a real hard thing to do. But what he actually did was he released Laura the Temptress, okay. which was a huge game. Yeah. And then Beneath a Steel Sky. Oh, now, right. I, know, I, was gonna say, Steel... I know Beneath a Steel Sky. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was released under Virgin. Yeah. And during this time, he also worked with Activision, US Gold as well, mm. who were uh, releasing a lot of the import titles. But, my God, this Beneath a Steel Sky was such a fantastic title. It was actually done with Dave Gibbons, okay. who created the Watchmen series, oh, wow. you know, the comic book. Yeah, article. yeah, yeah. I love Watchmen, yeah. Yeah, and then Charles went on to do Broken Sword, which was just amazing. And then the Knights Templar stuff. So he was doing stuff with the Da Vinci Code. So he actually met Ron Howard, talked about the Da Vinci Code game. And then recently, he's redone Beyond uh, Beneath a Steel Sky and created Beyond a Steel Sky and also released Broken Sword for the Switch. So wow. this is so much that we're going to have to do two parts. It's been a while since we've done a two-part show. I was going to say, so yeah, we're doing this as two parts um, simply because he had so much good stuff to say. And sometimes we interview these people for ages, you know, for an hour, two hours, two and a half hours, but it's just too good to snip it all. And ultimately we are the retro hour but not the retro three yeah. hours so <laughs> and you know we didn't want to leave this on the cutting room floor you know because yeah. there's so much good stuff so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering a kind of beginning from text adventures in this part and going to beneath a steel sky and then the second part is going to be all about puzzles broken sword the da vinci code and the modern versions mm. of the games that he's created for the switch that's wicked i can't wait to listen to that because i've not heard it yet so that's going to be wicked and that's coming up in about 15 minutes after a couple of news articles yeah but first we need to talk oktoberfest oh do you man. know what oktoberfest is joe i do know what oktoberfest and it's actually something my wife has always wanted to go to in germany i went last year i know and i'm so jealous <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah i'm still probably hung over <laughs> it was a really good time and, you know, we've got an awesome deal for you here. Mm-hmm. And to celebrate Oktoberfest from the comfort of your own home, because you can't go out at the moment, you can't go around, we're offering you a free case of eight German craft beers from Beer 52, the world's biggest beer club. Oh, wow. Now, all you have to do is go to www.beer52.com forward slash retro, and you pay five ninety five for the postage because that's quite a heavy package to Mm -hmm. actually get them delivered straight to your door but the beers are free yeah the awesome thing about this is every month they get a visit from a different country and you know these beers are carefully created and uh, cases sent to their lucky members so this month it is germany yeah and they're celebrating the world's biggest beer festival now i went over to germany and 
they had beers that were very different mm. to the beers over here. Have you heard of wheat beer? I have not, but I do know German beer is not to be messed with. <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's some, like the wheat beer is yeah. the strong stuff, but it's really tasty. Mm-hmm. And then you've got like the pilsners and stuff, Ooh, but yeah. you can, in this package, you can uh, discover incredible beers that actually haven't even been in the UK. Oh, wow. Like Coast German IPA mm-hmm. and Fest Beer. Uh, half these names I can't pronounce at the moment. But if you really like dark or light beer, there's a different option that you can choose. Each case comes with the award-winning beer magazine for men. Mm-hmm. And you also get a tasty snack to enjoy with your beer. Because I remember when I was at Oktoberfest and getting those currywurst and bratwurst sausages. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> it was kind of an essential part of it. Mm-hmm. Now, Absolutely. there's no minimum commitment with this. You can just get a free case, try the beers and see what you think. So if it's not for you, then you can pause and cancel the subscription anytime. You're not kind of locked into this. You just go to beer52.com forward slash retro to claim your free case of eight craft beers. Now that's beer52.com forward slash retro. So raise your ma to the wonderful nation of Germany and Let's get the beer 52 beers in. Proust. (laughs) You can't go wrong, to be honest. I mean, eight free beers, £5.95, you know, celebrating Oktoberfest from the comfort of your own home while everything's a little bit different. So get on it, guys. I'm going to do this myself, you know. Yeah, so am I. I I really fancy some of those German beers. Exactly. I'm going to sit back, kick back with my brother probably and uh, just have a snack, some beers and, you know, chill with some retro games. So speaking of retro games, starting off this week's news... What's this about a new Amstrad game? Yeah, so we've been seeing loads of cool Amstrad games appearing. And mm-hmm. I, I quite like it, actually, because the development seems to be really high graphically. Like, I don't know about you, but when I associated stuff with the Amstrad, it wasn't the the, the nicest kind of I was going to say, or... nice graphics isn't a word I would, you know, usually associate with the Amstrad personally. <laughs> and it was a very capable machine. Yeah. It's just I don't think they had the development, but mm. this stuff looks fantastic. Have you seen this, uh, Brick Rick? I haven't seen it. So, so, so essentially, what is this? This is a new cassette game for the Amstrad. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of like a bubble bubble game. Okay, so it's a single screen game, yeah. arcade game, fifty stages on it, mm-hmm. and you've kind of got to play with the enemies, kick them back. Uh, there's loads of different types, like aliens, UFO, brains, worms, zombies the time monster but also they have physical releases of this and i always love physical releases because it's like if you're a proper collector of that system you want to get it boxed don't you yeah 100 percent. and when when does this so so it's brick rick the collector's edition so is this like it's not not, it is a brand new game it's not like a remaster or re-release or anything like that no it's brand new game for the system it's going to be available on the 2nd of november okay and pre-orders possible at the moment. Uh, it's really cool, actually. If you get the collector's edition, yeah, it comes with a cardboard box, a three-inch disc, which is so cool to have the original disc. Yeah, SD card okay. with disc images on them, an MP3 soundtrack, and extras, a manual, uh, a coloring book with color pencils <laughs> as well, uh, A4 poster, you know, stickers shrink wrapped as well, and that's like twenty-eight euros. Oh wow! Okay. Really? Really good deal, I think. That's pretty cool. I mean, is there many Amstrad games coming out these days? Because obviously we cover a lot of like Dreamcast games and, you know, hacked Game Boys and stuff like that. But there was that Batman one. Group one that was releasing those amazing looking racers oh, okay. as well. And yeah. I've just looked at this as well and it's available on cassette, yeah. which I think is just so cool that they've got a cassette version out there as well. I think sometimes it's cool just to have these things when you're interested in the console, like because of... You know, there's a lot of these kind of like limited run games and stuff like that. You don't necessarily play them, but it's just nice to have in like the big PC box and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's cool. We always love seeing games come out for systems that were abandoned a long time ago. Mm, yeah, definitely. Now, have you seen this article? This is on Tech Digest and it's a real tiny one, but I thought, you know, this 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 has got some good talking points, really. Yeah, it's about the history of online gaming. Um, which I didn't realise started as early as, as this article saying. Apparently it started in the 70s, um, as far back as Atari, at the Atari 2600. Like I knew... Yeah, even even before that. So we had a guest called Richard Bartle. Yeah. 
who talked about mud, which was a multi-user dungeon. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, that was in the 1980s yeah, on yeah. ARPANET, which was basically played between the universities. Oh, wow. oh which, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember when we had him on. So, I mean, yeah, which is absolutely mental. I mean, I didn't. I mean, we've mentioned it before, but like the article. I mean, it kind of kind kind of goes through the history of it, but it doesn't just talk about PC, which I like. It talks about you know consoles as well, and it you know it talks about like I say, game line on the Atari yeah. twenty six hundred, which was, if I remember rightly, that was when you kind of like downloaded games, wasn't it? Online. Yeah, there's one that they've missed out here actually, which yeah. was the Mega Drive one in Brazil. Oh which yeah, we talked about and. Uh, that was fantastic tech toy when they had online banking and an online kind of delivery service. And SegaNet was quite big early on, wasn't it? That doesn't seem to have a mention, but yeah. they do mention the Dream Dreamcast saying it was the first internet ready console. Yeah, it was the first one that came like you know prepackaged internet ready and stuff. But yeah, I was thinking there was SegaNet, and I forget what the Nintendo one was called in Japan, like the Nintendo on Nintendo Online. What was it called? Well, it might have just been Nintendo Online or something, but that was in the early 90s on the Super Nintendo as well. And if I remember rightly, you could like make bets on horse races and stuff like that, but then you could <laughs> also download, I think it was called like Nintendo Satellite View, and you could oh, download nice. like other versions of A Link to the Past, you know, the Zelda game and stuff like that, which, you know, you can now get hacks of on cartridge, you know, because people managed to get it on their cartridges and stuff like that. But essentially how that one works, which was really cool, it was like, they would tell you a date in a time when this game was going to be live to download. And then you literally downloaded it and you got an hour to play it and you could complete like, it would come with it's a, new, a brand new dungeon using all the assets from that game. And then you got If you pulled out your lead, yeah. did you kind of get longer? <laughs> well, I don't know because I think what happened was, was people managed to get them stored on the cartridge because it came with like a cartridge that you connected. Oh, so you downloaded it. On, on, straight onto the on, cartridge. Straight onto the cartridge. Cool. And then I think what people do now is essentially they they people have copied those cartridges and now you can jump on eBay and you can just find these games on like custom made cartridges to play and stuff like that, which is really cool. But yeah, it, it, it's a really interesting article on Tech Digest about the history. I, I think they make a good point here. They say that the Dreamcast was the first internet ready console because yeah. it featured a web browser. Oh, which... okay. You know, I don't think there was any other browsers for these systems. They were all not like the time. closed internal Sega yeah. systems. Yeah, or... no, no, not at all. I mean, for me, the Wii, the Wii and my Xbox 360 were kind of like the first, or was it the Xbox One? No, yeah, it was the Wii and my Xbox One, funny enough, where you could actually just sit on the internet and go on YouTube and watch a film in like really, really... Bad. I think my, <laughs> I'd say my first fun online experience where there was no lag and there was none of that was on the xbox one yeah it uh, was on the xbox original oh really the, and the original one. yeah yeah and i and i found that was really really good online yeah. but then i started getting beaten by 12 year olds <laughs> and i just gave up i think for me it was um me and my friends we used to go to an internet cafe in the early 2000s and we used to go play i want to say i think it was like battlefield vietnam and battlefield 1942 and we used to play them and I was actually terrible at them. And I used to just, but I was just excited to be running around knowing I was playing online with other people and like would just be running around in the desert trying to hide more than anything than die because I'm spending a couple of quid each time for every half an hour I'm in there. But yeah, for, for home experience, it was probably the original Xbox at my uncle's house and then the Xbox 360. So, but yeah, it's a really interesting article. Um, and then it obviously dives into modern gaming as well. I can't believe you mentioned internet cafes. God, they're so old school. <laughs> you, you know what? As old school as they, they say they are, I was actually in York on Saturday. Um, I, I went to Saw Film Gaming, which is a retro game shop. And while I was there, I popped into game. And I walked in and there was like two doorways. There was like a like a, a, like a wall separating the doorway. And to the left, it was an internet cafe. And to the right, wow. it was game. And I was like, I, I only thought they were in like places where people couldn't get access to the countries, like uh, like internet. poorer countries, or couldn't get access to online. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. There was like vending machines, you know, of like drinks and stuff, but it was all like your American drinks, you know, like all the different flavors of Mountain Dew and all the crazy flavors of Fanta that we can't usually get in the UK. And then rows and rows of PC set up with like gaming on it and i couldn't believe it i was just like wow like because i know gamestop are trying to do stuff like that in the us so 
I didn't know. It sounds like you went into a portal to yeah, another world or something. I did. Yeah. <laughs> That's just York, you know. But um, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was so confused. Like I was just like, I, I didn't walk into that bit. I was just like t- taken back by it. So wow. yeah, it's, in- it's interesting that I mentioned that because I wasn't even thinking about it. <laughs> Well, you're a Resident Evil fan, aren't you? So you've got some exciting reboot news here. Oh, gosh. Well, I saw this earlier today and I sent it to Ravi and I said, please, please let me talk about this. So it's been announced late last night today. So October 6th, uh, at the point of his recording this, the show will be out on Friday. Um, So this news would be a couple of days old by then. But it has been announced they are rebooting the Resident Evil film franchise with a brand new Resident Evil film. Um, which is coming to us from Constantine Film, um, which from far as far as I know from the article I was reading, they they're pretty much the guys behind some of the cheaper shark attack films. Like um, oh okay, forty seven. Like, I'm sorry, but I've not seen any Resident Evil films. Uh, keep what are they way. like? Is, is there a high that. standard? Or? Uh, well, I think there's seven of them, maybe six of them, and I'm a huge, okay. huge, huge Resident Evil. F- fan like listeners of the show know how much i love resident evil but when i say i'm a huge resident evil fan i'm a huge fan of the games the original games the first kind of four or five games um so what's really cool about this is it is based on the first two games and it's going to apparently be a it's an original story but it's going to be faithful to the two games the first original two games so it's set in the spencer mansion and in raccoon city which I'm a little bit dubious about because the first game set in the Spencer Mansion and the second game set in Raccoon City. So I don't know how they're going to fit that into one game unless they have two kind of stories running side by side or something like that. But the original films, which are from like 2001 to like 2016, I guess I like them to an extent, but they're kind of popcorn films. If you're going in just to kind of watch a brain dead action film with zombies and you're not going to, and just don't think about Resident Evil, then they're, they're, perfectly watchable if that makes sense but they yeah. don't they they screw up all the characters they screw up all the, the enemies they just kind of make up their own story like only the first two films kind of have any sort of resemblance to the resident evil games um in terms of like what's happening in the world in them and stuff like that um so it, it was definitely due a reboot like i would i'm definitely glad they're rebooting it rather than making carrying on with that if that makes sense carrying on with psychic powers and made up so you don't get those kind of goosebumps when you watch a film about a subject that you're really into and you kind of connect with it you get a bit of a disconnect when you're watching these yeah if you're a big fan of the resident evil films i think it is a, a resident evil games the original resident evil films are probably yeah like a bit of a disconnect aren't you say the first one's relatively faithful but the characters aren't from the games it's all different characters made up characters and stuff like that and then in the second film it's kind of based on the third game and the characters are there, but they're not massively faithful. Um, but yeah, apparently in this, they've already cast Chris and Claire Redfield from the first two games, Leon and Jill from the first two games and Wesker and William G who were the bad guys from the first two games. So straight away, you didn't get those characters until like two, three, four films in, in the other Resident Evil films. Whereas this, is going to be about the actual characters from Resident Evil, which is pretty cool. And maybe they'll turn it round, Joe. Yeah. Maybe you'll get your Resi film. That you yeah, really maybe we will. So I'm sure I'll be talking about it when it comes out. But I think it's interesting that this has come out off the back of the success of the Sonic the Hedgehog film, the announcement of the CGI Super Mario film coming next year. So I think, you know, they're kind of like putting their fingers back in these pies and just being like, okay, what can we reboot? What can we kind of like, you know, milk, if you will? And, you know, it also comes off the back of it's the 25th anniversary of Resident Evil this year as well. So maybe it's all kind of linked in with that. Well, interesting news on the Nintendo side. It looks like Nintendo are going mega violent. Um, I'm quite shocked about this. We knew it was coming because we had uh, Vince Desi on the show from Running With Scissors. And we're talking about Postal Redux coming to the nintendo switch now postal is one of the most controversial violent video games in history uh many refer to it as a murder simulator and it's been banned in over 10 countries now what do you think about this because nintendo have always aimed at that kind of kids market uh, family friendly aren't innocent they? one and this is like like to be honest i We've had Vince on the show and everything, but I can't play Postal One because it's it's so kind of 
just hardcore and, and, and psychotic for me. <laughs> like Postal 2 has a lot more comedy elements in it. Yeah. Postal 1 is pretty disturbing. And if you know about the like Columbine massacre. Yeah. Cause these it... guys are going around in trench coats, so uh, killing innocent people in the towns. And it, there's a lot of connection with that stuff and that kind of time. So I, I, I'm shocked by this move by Nintendo, to be honest. It is a bit strange because Nintendo have always been family friendly, but it's not the first time they've put out super violent games because it was Mad World on the Wii, which was... Yeah, I think I think this is something different, though. <laughs> like, so, that's like Mortal Kombat and the finishing moves in Mad World. Yeah, are, yeah. Are, and, like, you're is, fighting and, to fight someone. In this one, you're, ju- where is this you're just killing up, innocents. This is straight this up one. just running around killing innocent people. So... I don't know. The I just the only thing I can think of like is maybe it's just kind of fallen through the cracks at Nintendo or something. Like I don't know. I don't know how they've got away with this. I mean, I don't know how I feel about it. I'm, I'm, do, do, do you think there's not any other handhelds in that market that could be like adult that they're trying to get the adult handheld as well as the yeah the young one? We know obviously Switch kind of they they own the handheld market now. There isn't really. I mean. I probably people could be screaming at me right now, but I'm not really thinking of any other handheld other than mobile gaming. That's you know kind of got any sort of competitor to the Switch in terms of handheld gaming. So maybe you're right; they are trying to appeal to that more adult market because obviously the Switch is doing really well. So I don't know. I, I don't know what what their thought process is because it just feels like if they're going to do Postal, they'd slap it on the PS4 or on the Xbox One as you know as like a ten pound game or something. Or they would put it on iOS or something like that. But yeah, on the Switch, it just seems like a really, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad choice. It's just, it's Nintendo. Like Nintendo aren't about that, are they? So yeah, that's weird. what I mean. Like, you know, I, I'm not one to censor games or anything. We've had Vince on the podcast and I I, I think it's a, it's a good title for people that like it. And it's yeah. not as bad as a game like Hatred, yeah. which is pretty much a training manual on <laughs> um, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it's got comedy elements in there. Kind of sick humour, but <laughs> comedy elements in there. But I'm just shocked to see it on coming Nintendo. out on the Switch, really. And I think this is going to spark a whole load of controversy because parents are going to come in and find their kids playing this or mm, something and mm. just be like, oh, my God, that's Nintendo. You know, and it's it's weird having an audience that's so family friendly before and then just suddenly dropping something like that on it. Yeah, it's definitely something you would have never found on on the GameCube or or the Wii, I guess. But we'll see. We'll follow it. And if we see any more news about it after it comes out, uh, if there's any sort of controversy over it and stuff like that, I guess we'll discuss it and kind of see what happens, see if it gets banned. <laughs> yeah, and there's, well, there's Postal 2 to come and there's a few other follow-on titles as mm. well. And trust me when I say this, Postal 2 is absolutely awesome. It is sick as well, but you can do stuff like have a cat gun <laughs> where you fire cats at people. You know, it's got that, it's got more of a kind of fun element to it. Yeah. Well, I've, you know what? I've never actually played the postal games. So, I mean, I know what they are and stuff like that. So maybe it's time that I pick it up and maybe I'll come back and I'll go, this game is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is this kind of thing? I mean, I probably won't. I'll probably laugh at it. Yeah, well, if you're interested in the kind of background of Postal, listen to our interview with Vince Desi because it's one of the best that we've done. And, you know, Vince goes into the whole kind of history and also the reasons why he did a lot of it. Mm. And, you know, a lot of the reasons aren't actually kind of w- how it originally came out. I think it was more, more, more about the timing when that was released and what was going on in the world with Columbine and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting to say the least that it's coming out on Nintendo, but... We'll see how that goes down in the next couple of months, won't we? Yeah. Now, before we're joined by Charles Cecile, I've just got a quick message from our sponsor, ExpressVPN. Ravi, when you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? You don't want random passerbys looking in on you. So why would you let people look in on you when you're going online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door, mate. I like the metaphor. You know, I'm a big fan of ExpressVPN and it's because of stuff like this. You know, some internet service providers, uh, especially in America, have 
basically been looking at the websites that you've been visiting. Mm -hmm. And worse, they can actually sell this information to ad companies, tech giants, and they'll actually use your data to kind of target you. Mm. Now, ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet, so your online activity cannot be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices. It works on everything, laptops, phones, even routers. So if anyone shares your Wi-Fi, you can still be protected, even if they don't have ExpressVPN. And that's a really cool thing, actually. You can put it on your router so mm -hmm. you can have your whole house vpn Now, the best part of using ExpressVPN is it's easy as closing the bathroom door. You can fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. Now, ExpressVPN is the number one rated VPN by CNET, Wired, and The Verge, and, of course, the Retro Hour. So if you're like me and you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com forward slash retro today and you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com forward slash retro. And another way you can support the podcast is by donating. And, you know, our donators and patrons are absolutely awesome, aren't they, Joe? Yeah, you guys are absolutely killing it for us at the moment. So essentially, we set up a Patreon a couple of months ago. The idea was, well, it was about six months ago now. The idea was we were going to use the money which we're getting in from you lovely lot every month to start our own studio in our city centre because of we were recording at where Dan works and pretty much it was becoming really hard for us. We've been doing interviews at two in the morning, interviews at six in the morning and using another workspace was just becoming increasingly difficult for us. So and the idea was we we're going to set up our own studio. However, we have changed it a little bit with your guys' permission recently and we've been using the money to set up our own home studios due to lockdown and COVID. And so far, it's we, we cannot express our gratitude enough you guys are helping us run the show at the moment and every single penny goes back into the running of the show and you know what like dan's away at the moment mm -hmm. because he's got some family stuff going on he's probably going to be back with us next week but pretty much me and joe have been running the show on our own and without you guys help we wouldn't have actually been able to do this you know it would have been kind of two weeks without any retro yeah. hour but thanks to our fantastic patrons we've got the equipment here we've managed to sign up for the recording service and you know you guys get a reward as well if you back us you get an ad free episode so please support us at the retrohour.com forward slash support and as well as that we'll always give everybody who supports us a shout out on the most prestigious high score table of all time which is the retro hour high score table just like our supporters this week Peter Jeffrey, Chris McLeod, Darren Lomax, Ashley Kingston, one of our regular patrons that's in the actual uh, meetup chats, and Matthew Beeman. Thank you so much for your support, guys. And next, we have Charles Cecile, part one, founder of Revolution Software. We're going to talk Arctic, Activision, Virgin, US Gold, Laura the Temptress, and Beneath the Steel Sky. You're listening to the Retro Hour, and I'm here with Charles Cecil, and we're talking Revolution Software. How are you doing, Charles? I'm doing really well, and thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Ah, thanks. Well, one question we always ask our guests first is, like, what was your first gaming experience, or the first time you saw a video game? The very first time I played on a computer was in about 1979. My school had one. But I don't remember if I played a game. So I'm actually going to go for the Space Invader in the local pub when I was working um, for Ford uh, as, a, as, a, as an engineer, um, management trainee engineer. Um, and I'm going to juxtapose that with trips to, I think it was Tandy, um, which had a Magnavox. And at lunchtime, we'd go and play Pong on the Magnavox. Uh, and we did that for a few, few lunchtimes in a row until the shop assistant made it. It was quite clear that we were never going to buy this thing and could not afford to because it was really, really expensive. And we got chucked out. And um, so, so so then it was just going to the local pub and sticking 10 peas into, in, into Space Invaders. Um, so yeah, those were the first gaming experiences. 
I think it's a really uniquely British thing to have the game inside the pub because they would be scattered in all kinds of locations, these arcades. I remember seeing stuff in chip shops. Did you see <laughs> stuff in uh, unusual locations back in the day? I did. And, and people would say, oh, you should go to the arcades. You should go to the arcades. And so I went on a pilgrimage, I remember, to uh, Dean Street in London, where they had some really big arcades. And uh, I know that on, you know, on, on the rest of Europe, in the rest of Europe, a lot of people went to arcades, but it wasn't something that we did, was it? No, you're absolutely right. We went to the chip shop or the pub or, 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 or just, you know, places where you would be doing something else. So you play the game as a, as, as, as a side um, entertainment rather than, you know, continental Europe where you go to the arcades just to play the games. Yeah, it was quite different. Absolutely. Well, you were really into adventure stuff. And uh, what were your kind of influences? Were you like into certain series or, or adventure books at the time when you were younger? Well, what, what um, I, I did enjoy reading and, of course, films. But the big inspiration from a games perspective is that um, Richard Turner, who was my friend, that uh, my, my drinking buddy, um, we'd, we'd first met um, when we were both at Ford. Uh, he hadn't set up Arctic at this point, and uh, I suggested that we go for a run together. So he turned up in his, you know, running stuff, and we went for a run. It wasn't very far, and then he said, "Ah, oh, that was lovely. We should do that again, you know, next week." So we did, and he turned up in the car and he said, I'm, "We're going for a run to the pub. We're not, you know, we're not doing any of this nonsense." Um, so we just went to the pub instead and and, and played games. So one day he he'd started Arctic. Um, just like just a few months before, and he invited me to come and see what was what was happening. And his partner up in Hull was a fellow called Chris Thornton that he'd been at school with. And um, Chris had a TRS-80, which was wonderful. It was so much more advanced than the ZX-81 that we had at that time. Um, and we started playing some adventure games um, by Scott Adams. And um, they, they were great. They were really fun. And Richard turned around to me and he said, um, "You enjoy writing stories and telling you writing stories and telling telling stories." And I said, "Yes." He said, "You should write some adventures. If you want to write some adventures, then I'll write the compiler uh, and um, you write it, and I'll I'll code it, and we'll publish it." And that was it. Uh, I said, "Yeah, sounds like a good idea." So I did, and here I am, <laughs> forty years and later. Those were <laughs> and those were the uh, Scott Adams uh, Adventure International. Yes titles yes, that yes, were yes. massively influential yes. they were kind of like the colossal caves of uh, adventure i say they, they were and but the the interesting thing is that back in those days um we were publishing on the sinclairs the sinclair zx81 then the spectrum um, before that of course the zx80 um and france was uh, sinclair territory uh, as was belgium but germany was commodore commodore 60 c16 and 64 um as was scandinavia and America, of course. And so for a number of years, we were publishing in the UK and nothing was coming from outside the UK. We knew nothing about what was going on in Japan with Nintendo, uh, in America with, with Commodore and, and a number of other. And it was, it was very, very insular, but it was also insulated. And it meant that we could develop and sell games with only other UK competitors. Uh, and that actually, and I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that created a sort of cocoon, which was really helpful because it meant you could make mistakes, you could experiment. Nobody kind of knew what what would work and what wouldn't work, um, and it was an incredible time. You're right. It was kind of in a in a in a world of its own, and the world was a, a lot more smaller back then. Um, writing for the ZX81, how did that machine kind of open? open you to the world of programming well the zx81 was absolutely fantastic you know as 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 a kid before well kid i was 18 before uh, obviously the the internet there were problems that you you know if, if one was curious one could solve problems using a computer that wouldn't have been possible before and somebody had claimed i remember that if you bet on uh, in in roulette if you bet on red and if you lost, then you doubled your money and you kept doubling your money, but then went back to one, then eventually you could make a lot of money. And I, that, that struck, stuck with me. And, and, and so I, I got a ZX81 and I thought, I know, I'll write a program and I'll leave it on overnight and I will see actually whether this is, is accurate or not. And 
it was extraordinary because the program was obviously not very difficult to write. And the ZX81 went round and round and round. And it kicked out, you know, data that I thought was absolutely fascinating, not least because I could never have found it out any other way. And, you know, we, we laugh about the ZX-61. Of course, it had one K of memory. It was, you know, it was ludicrous. It was pitiful. And yet the ZX-81 had the same memory and the same processing power as the computers that landed Apollo 11 on the moon in 1969. So really, you know, if you think in 1981, these things were incredible. These were as powerful as multi-million dollar computers that NASA had used to perform this incredible journey across space. And, you know, we thought they were amazing. And actually, on my shelf, I've got a, a 1K chess that Arctic wrote. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, iPhones now have 256 million times as much memory. But we were able to write a chess program in 1K. We could do things that were really quite extraordinary. I mean, one of the most memorable games is J.K. Gray's um, Monster Maze, which uh, on a ZX81, I think that was probably required 16K. But it was it was brilliant, and it was kind of like a first person adventure shooter game, um, except that you weren't shooting and you were being pursued by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, there were lots of really really wonderful you know ideas that emerged at that time. And I think with those machines as well, like other countries may have looked down on them or seen them as maybe a, a cheap alternative, but they actually did the job, and you could run you know those adventure international games on there you could run 3d monster maze and actually you know get stuff done on them so so they were really pioneering machines well, well they were and then something else i'd add to that is that you know the americans had 16k and we had 1k the americans had floppy disks uh, and we had cassettes and you know arm is one of the most amazing companies you know in the world uh, based in cambridge and you know now they're called advanced risk machines but for some of us, we remember that they used to be called Acorn Research Machines because they were the creators of the ZX81. Sorry, of the, of the BBC Micro, beg your pardon. And the point is that because those British programmers, because us British programmers had so little memory, we immediately started writing in Z80. We went right down to the metal because we had to. Um, while the Americans had more processor power, they had more memory, and they stayed higher level, which meant that we went in a completely different direction to the Americans. Um, they would see uh, whatever high-level program it was at the time. Uh, we were machine code. And, you know, a, a friend of mine, Tony Warren, I remember um, quite recently, uh, and he was a proper coder. I just did it because I, you know, loved it, was interested. Um, but he turned around and, and he said, what was return in Z80? And, you know, immediately I said it was C9. And that was it because you you kind of learnt these things. Um and it, they, you know, it's extraordinarily fast. If you could write efficiently in machine code, you know, you could do amazing things, much, much more so than you could do in basic. Um, so we developed a generation of extraordinary programmers who kind of grew up from the very bottom, you know, really, really having to push the metal, uh, and 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 then just continuing to do so. Um, and, you know, that's why we, in the UK, we became one of the first countries uh, in the world to have computer science on the curriculum. Um, and then Tony Blair's education minister scrapped it because uh, she thought it was too hard. And we lost that lead um, by some stupid government decision. But anyway, that's a different, that's a different subject. Well, similarities with America was the kind of cottage industry that was around these games companies and these initial ones, you were actually in one of these companies, Arctic, where you were like printing your own covers, even kind of packaging your own games. Was it a, oh, yeah. a lot of work and a lot of fun? And how did you get involved? Well, as I say, Richard invited me up to to his, um, his parents' house in Hull um, one weekend. And as I said, we, we started, you know, playing games on a TRS-80 and it was just incredible. Um, and... Obviously, TRS-80 was an import machine, so the only computers that people had were, were, were the ZX-81 and the ZX-80s before them. Um, and it felt like it was just a fad. It didn't feel like it was going to grow. I mean, obviously, you know, if you look at the games industry now, overtaking the film industry, overtaking the music industry, you know, 10 years or 15 years ago, how long it was, uh, it would have been absolutely unthinkable 
unthinkable back in 1981. You know, in hindsight, I'm extraordinarily grateful to Richard and to Chris for welcoming welcoming me into their fledgling company and um, inviting me to write adventure games. And there was quite a lot of talent there as well. John Rittman was there as well, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, John Rittman. Um, at, at Arctic, we were both developing games, but also publishing them. And, um, you know, uh, John Rittman stuck it, sent in a game uh, for, 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 I think it was for the ZX81 rather than the, might have been for the, for the um, Sinclair Spectrum. Um, and it was called Namtier Raiders. That was his first game. And Namtier was Rittman, Rittman in, in reverse. <laughs> and um, then he he produced a, a, a fantastic 3D polygonal game, and I can't even remember the name, but it was I think it was the first 3D game um, that was available. And the funny thing is that you know had we added a story, had we added a console, there's so much we could have done. Um, but actually, it was just a tech demo, and we published it as a tech demo. And we you know I, it was quite clear fairly soon after that that we squandered a huge opportunity. But, you know, as I say, we just, we kind of were making it up as we went along. It was, it was an incredible time. Well, you were mainly doing text adventures there. And um, did you find that like, whilst other text adventures were coming out and kind of passes were developing, um, the text adventure scene turned into a bit of a kind of an arms race, essentially? Well, it, it did. I started, right. I wrote uh, three adventure games. Um, they were Natalie uh, uh, called Adventures B, C and D. Uh, because Richard had already written Adventure A. Um, and I remember really well somebody saying, oh, you know, I think I could, you know, yours were fine, but but these will be better. And I kind of believed them. And it was such a stupid thing to do because then we had Adventures E and probably F and G, but but nobody played them. They, they, they fell off a cliff. But at the same time, we had had The Hobbit had come out and that was way, way, way more advanced than what we had done. Um, there was the quill, your own, write your own text adventure. So um, yeah. things move very, very fast. But And, and then uh, Adventure International, uh, Mike Woodruff uh, started publishing the, the games from America, the adventure games from America. But by that time, everything had changed and nobody quite noticed. So I guess we were lucky because in those early 80s, very early 80s, 1981, 82, well, I mean, I'll give you an, an example. We, we wrote a, a Space Invaders game at Arctic and a Galaxians game. And I remember talking to Richard um, about what we should call it. And one of us said, can't we just call it Galaxians? Nobody quite knew. So we just called it Galaxians. We called it ZX Galaxians. Um, And we didn't know any better. And nobody came after us. Nobody noticed. So we just called the next one Space Invaders and Frogger. And, you know, we we just used the names, which was, you know, born out of naivety more than anything else. But we were just this tiny, tiny little cottage industry and nobody cared and nobody noticed. Um, it was only really when Nintendo uh, launched the NES uh, and it was so successful that uh, people started noticing. Uh, companies like Imagine, that of course wrote Bandersnatch, um, came along, Ocean, then US Gold, um, and you know, it became a serious, serious industry at that point. But you know, Arctic really was a cottage industry and fell away pretty quickly once the much better funded um, and much more professional companies came along. Well, let's talk about US Gold for a bit because US Gold were kind of the importers of the games from America, but you had a really good relationship with them when you formed uh, Paragon Programming. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Well, the, the relationship with US Gold actually started um, when Arctic were in a very, very weak financial position. Um, and we got a call from a guy called Tim Cheney. And um, Tim was at US Gold. And they asked if we could convert uh, Arctic's uh, World Cup soccer. And again, we hadn't got the World Cup license or anything, but we didn't worry about that um, to, for, 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 for them. This would have been around about 1985. And um, I said, well, we could do, but, you know, match day is a lot better from Ocean. That was actually written by John Rittman. And Tim said, no, no, we can't, we can't use it. I don't know why they couldn't, but, um, you know, we, we want you to produce this game. So Jeff Brown, who was, who'd founded US Gold, came to see us. He turned up in his uh, Ferrari Testarossa, I remember, oh, which nice. absolutely blew us all away. And, you know, commissioned this game that was going to become World Cup Carnival. Mexico 86. And I mean, I was deeply troubled um, because 
there were other football games that were better than ours, but he absolutely insisted that he wanted ours for whatever reason. It's, it, you know, Mexico 6 is not a game that I'm proud of. I, I like to blame Tony Warriner, who was the main programmer on that, but I have no doubt that he would blame me. Um, <laughs> and then I would probably pass it back to Tim Chaney and, and Jeff Brown, because um, they were the ones that commissioned it, knowing that, that, that we didn't have the strongest game in the world. Um, but anyway, I, I built a relationship with, with US Gold. And then when Arctic uh, finally started collapsing, Richard had, had left a few years before uh, and was actually working in kitchen software. And really, there was nowhere to go. There was nowhere to go for, for, for Arctic. Um, so I founded a company um, also based in Hull called Paragon. Um, and it was converting games. Uh, what US Gold had built a business on, which was very successful, was taking American licenses, um, mainly Commodore 64 games, um, and then converting them to Amstrad and Spectrum uh, for publishing to publish in, in Europe. And uh, that then got exp expanded because he, he then started taking on arcade licenses. Uh, when I, you know, Outrun was, was the one I remember particularly, you know, really, really top licenses and, and, and publishing them. And so for a couple of years, I had little, a little company um, doing conversions for US Gold and, you know, and, and very fun it was. And, and I'd like to give Tony, Tony Warren a mention because um, I'd met when we were at Arctic, when we were, uh, you know, not, we were on, we were beginning to decline. And we got this amazing game through the post called Obsidian. And it was from a local lad, uh, Tony Warrener, who lived in, in a place called Bruff, which was about, I don't know, six, seven miles from Brands Burton, which was where we were based just outside Hull. And um, this game was just fantastic. So uh, I invited Tony over for lunch. And I remember being very meek, very quiet. And we and I said, Tony, this is a great game. We'd love to publish it. And so he 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 licensed it to us, and um, it was very very well reviewed. I think it sold reasonably well. Um, and you know, I'm still very very good friends with Tony. I mean, Tony, I admire enormously. He's a, a terrific guy. Uh, so Tony then came to work at Arctic for for a bit of time, and then when it all started collapsing, and I I, I founded Paragon, um, Tony came and worked with me for a couple of years. Um, and we wrote, I remember, you know, there was a, uh, fighter bomber game from, from America. There was another Indiana Jones and, and the thuggies. Uh, it was a fun, it was a fun business, but then us gold actually came and asked me if I'd like to join them uh, as their head of development. And this seemed like such an extraordinary opportunity. Um, so I decided to wind down Paragon and, uh, I turned up and US Gold were one of the big publishers at the time. And I was so excited. I was going to have this big team and we could do amazing things. And I walk into my department and I find that there's me, a tester and a part-time master. And that is it. There is nobody oh, wow. else in development. We had the most amazing projects. Uh, as I say, we had, I, I remember coming in an outrun was, was our first, was one of our first projects. And it was, it was just, it, you know, it was just an amazing game to be, uh, to be converting, but it was just a ridiculously small team, and I think one of the one of the issues, probably the main issue, was that in U.S. Gold, marketing was king, um, sales were number two, um, probably admin was number three, and development was right at the bottom. They saw development as just a nuisance. You know, we were the people that never developed the games on time. And uh, I mean, I really enjoyed my time at US Gold and there were some amazing people. But as somebody, you know, with a passion for development, it was not a good environment. And previously, um, a, a friend, I'd been friends with somebody called Rod Cousins, who ran a company called Quicksilver, which you will probably know. Yeah. And Quicksilver had had some really big hits. Um, Sandy White's Ant Attack was one. Um, and I'm sure there are many others, which I can't remember now. Um, but we'd known Rod for, for a number of years, and he'd been very much part of the scene, as had Richard and I, of developers. Um, we, you know, every year we'd meet up for, for a nice dinner, and we'd have little awards called the Sir Clives. Um, the Sir Clives, because Clive Sinclair had just been made a knight. I think they were called yeah, the Sir Clives. That's an awesome name for an award. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> I've got my Sir Clive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember that there was one particular guy, there was one particular award called the Prick of the Year. And I'm not going to say who, <laughs> but the same person won it three years in a war. 
in, 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 in and they were called the, they were called the Quick Bites. That's right, because they were a there was a party uh, that was organised by Quicksilver and Bug Bite, and so they merged the two and they kind of invited their friends and we used to come along. But um, you know, it was it was all very very tongue in cheek, and it was just fun. And there are very very few of those people still around. You know, the British industry right at the very beginning. But anyway, sorry. So, so as I'm saying, and I, as, uh, I, this is kind of going back, and all these memories are coming, you know, forward. So, 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 thank you for indulging me in this. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, but, but, but it was it, it was fantastic, and it was it was it was really great. And you know, I'm just just madly trying to, you know, this was 40 years ago. So, you know, it it it, it was a fair few years ago. I'm just that I'm having to sort of remember. Anyway, I'm sorry. I keep I'm beginning to ramble. Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I, I was going to say it was working great into my timeline actually, because after US Gold, you got approached by Activision. Oh yes, okay. And... So thank you very much, and you're absolutely right. So basically, what <laughs> happened was that Rod Cousins, who, as I say, I'd known through Quicksilver, kept approaching me, and uh, when you know when 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 I met with him, he said, "Look, if you come and join me, development is number one." Marketing is number two, sales are number three. You will be number one. Um, and, you know, I didn't know quite what to expect. But then he said, and I'll tell you what, as well as giving you a much better salary, which he did, I'll give you um, a company Peugeot 205 1.9 GTI, which at the time was the most amazing and wonderful car. It was so fast. It was insane. And, and then he said, and I'll give you a car phone, which the company will pay for. And that was it. That was it. I was his. And I went to Activision and he was absolutely true to his word. Development was, you know, d- development led everything because, you know, what they realized, unlike US Gold, was that it was all about the quality of the game. You know, US Gold, I'd, I remember saying to Jeff Brown, look, I just don't have enough testing capacity. And he said to me, don't worry. If we release this game, there'll be thirty thousand people. They'll let us know if there's a problem, and <laughs> and, and and it was it was this idea. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, we'll, 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 we will talk about you know Virgin, but 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 you know again one of the and I know I'm, 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 this is one of the spoilers, but um, you know the head of of Virgin in the US, Martin Alper, you know took me out for lunch and he said that the reason he got he bought games, commissioned games so successfully is that he'd never played a video game in his life. You know, the problem, the problem with that period in the mid eighties was that it was run by people who actually despised the medium. You know, in the case of Martin Alper, he chose to live in, you know, chose to live in California um, close to the film industry because what he really wanted to be was a film person. Um, and he was slightly embarrassed by the medium. And, you know, developers were, were, were proud and, and, and saying, this is an incredible medium. We can tell stories in an amazing way. So there was a, a huge sort of disconnect between the practitioners who were really proud of the medium and the people with the money who, who rather despised it. So, and if, you know, Rod, Rod was if, absolutely not one of those people. Rod, what, what I'm trying to say is that Rod and, and the people at US Gold, you know, realized how important and you know, Rod was very passionate about the games that we produced and was very supportive. If you look at um, the rivals as well at the time, companies like Sierra, they were very focused on being a kind of interactive company, as well as Lucasfilm Games, which was essentially a, a, a film company that was then producing games, uh, spin-offs from its film franchise as well. Yes, indeed. And um, Sierra were, were, were amazing. Um, the reason that I knew Sierra quite well was because uh, at Activision, we were actually distributing them in throughout uh, Europe. And so Activision had a very close relationship with Sierra. And uh, Noreen, uh, who was one of the founders of Revolution with me, was actually their general manager. And so she knew an awful lot about what was going on at Activision, at, at, at Sierra. And I really admire Sierra. Um, and I'm really impressed that Ken Williams came on and um, talked. And it would be wonderful if you could get Roberta Williams because, you know, she's a very, very impressive um, developer. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. The, the, the only thing I would say is, that, you know, and I admire them enormously, but I remember Tim Schafer saying, and certainly this is what inspired me, was that, my God, those King, King's Quest games took themselves seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, I'm always so rude about Daventry. 
um, because I kind of know the original Daventry. Oh, I don't. I've driven through it. The idea of King Graham of Daventry was so ludicrous and so American Americans looking in and seeing, you know, this sort of Disney version or, or Las Vegas version of, Europe, of, of of Britain. And so, you know, I'm grateful to her both for writing amazing some amazing adventure games, but also making it quite clear what she was missing out on. And that was that level of humor. And so our very first game, a Revolution, um, which was uh, Lure of the Temptress, um, was very much written to try and appeal to a broader audience with both a serious story and a ludicrous dialogue, getting that sort of juxtaposition between the two. And, you know, a lot of that was both inspired by, for good and bad, by the games um, of Sierra, uh, later to become Sierra Online, of course. Well, each company had their own engine at the time, and uh, for LucasArts it was scum, and uh, also Sierra had their engine, and uh, you were working on the virtual theatre. How important was it to have an engine as the kind of foundation of Revolution? We didn't really have it as a foundation, um, because every time we wrote a new game, we wrote a new engine, which was really, really unfortunate. But, you know, back in those days, again, we didn't really know any better. Each time we wrote a new game, you know, Tony and Dave Sykes, who was another, those are both founders of Revolution as well, you know, would say, oh, let's write a new engine. And, you know, I didn't know any better and they didn't know any better than to build on the foundations um, and, and actually have systems that we could build on rather than starting again. But, you know, bear in mind that the, the you know, the, to, to start off with, you know, Revolution was born above a fruit shop and Dave and Tony, bless them, you know, worked in this freezing little room with no heating whatsoever through the winter. You know, for, forgive me for repeating this, because I said this before, but the very first, I, I had, a, I had a, a, a PC 386, which I was so proud of because it was so powerful and it played um, flight simulators and I loved it. And, you know, when, we, when, 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 when I started Revolution on an absolute shoestring, I, I lent these guys the PC um and we had an st and we had an amiga and they worked away with fingerless gloves because they were so cold that they had to have fingerless gloves and the, and beyond all of that the first equipment that was non-computer that i bought was a, a gas heater but the problem with the gas heater was that in this enclosed space it gave off terrible fumes so oh, what gosh. they what they did is they alternated between turning the gas heater on and opening the window or closing the window and turning the gas fire off um, and, you know, for about six months as we were building the prototype, um, that was the way that we worked. So what had happened is that at, at Activision, the company had uh, been very unprofitable. They had made some pretty silly mistakes. They'd actually bought um, uh, Infocom. And I remember going when I went over to uh, San Francisco to see them for the first time. And I went to see this, this area that was the Infocom area. And I was expecting it to be full of computers and cool guys. And they were just like two or three people because it was considered to be so you know, out of fashion and so old fashioned that um, all they were doing was um, appealing to a very, very small audience and selling, you know, selling their, their legacy games. Um, but uh, Activision was not well run, to be honest with you, by the American side. And uh, it ran into trouble after about a year and then went bankrupt and collapsed. And it dragged down the European side, which actually was very well run. So I remember my, my boss's boss at the time, a fellow called Jeff Mulligan, flew over. And um, uh, while he was with us, um, a, a friend who I'd met many times when I was at US Gold called Sean Brennan um, was now the deputy managing director at um, Mirasoft. Mirasoft was um, one of the Mirror Group companies. Uh, ultimately owned by Robert Maxwell. And it was so incredibly successful. And Sean was voracious in signing up talent. And he drove to Reading, where we were based. He took me out to lunch and he said, look, I can't promise anything, but we really need titles. You know, you, 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 you wrote all these games at Arctic. If you wanted to go back into development, we'd look very favorably on any games that you wrote. And this was just an incredibly exciting and generous thing for Sean to have said. So um, I pulled together the team 
And I said, look, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to write an adventure game. But it's going to be much more um, ambitious than anything. It's going to have the idea of characters walking around the world. And the puzzles are going to emerge from, you know, from interacting with those characters, which which is ultimately what virtual theatre turned out to be. And and in many ways, we reused again for Beyond the Steel Sky more recently. But I think I'm probably jumping ahead when I say that. So anyway, we, we, we wrote this game um, and it, it, it has some terrible um, name i can't remember i think it might have been vengeance just some stupid name that was always going to be a, a a working title and tony and dave bless them worked above this fruit shop and um, produced this demo and the, the big day came to present to mirasoft i knew that the 386 which was by far the most valuable piece of kit that we had um absolutely had to be kept safely so they wrapped it in a blanket they put a seat on it uh, they put a, a, a seat belt around it and it was it was transported really really carefully um, down to London, where I was staying. You know, ahead of the meeting with Mirasoft. And um, Tony and Dave came in and um, sat down, and we talked about it. We had a glass of wine, and we had a very jolly time. Um, then we went to bed, uh, probably having drunk too much wine. I think I think, which was rather foolish. But anyway, woke up the next morning, and I looked outside, and the car window had been smashed. The car window oh, that no. they'd driven down in had been smashed. Which was quite common in those days because people st stole car radios um, because you could you could sell them on. And suddenly I realised we hadn't brought the three eight six in. It was oh, it had been left in the back of the car, and you can imagine the colour drained from my face. And I dashed down to the car. I mean, the radio had been stolen, and guess what was still sitting there on the back seat, strapped <laughs> in the three eight six. They, they didn't know their technology. <laughs> they didn't know their technology. And had they taken that 386, that would have been the end of revolution because there was no way on God's earth that we would have been able to buy another one. Oh God, I've heard so many stories of people leaving stuff in cars on display and it getting nicked and that whole no, kind no. of project going in companies. So we, we went the in developers, the if you're listening, never leave something in the car. No, don't, don't. <laughs> please, please, please don't. I mean, we were just very lucky. I mean, there's been so much serendipity um, in in you know through revolution and, and indeed through my life. Um, to, 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 I'm very lucky, and um, you need you need to be lucky um, to, to get the rakes often. But we we, we yeah. then went and um, did the presentation to Mirasoft the next day, uh, and it went down well. Um, and we we were signed up, and that was great, and that meant that we could move to a little office, which was a 1950s office in the centre of Hull. Still very, very cheap. Um, and I collected the most amazing team of people. At Activision, my lead tester was a guy called Dave Cummins, who very sadly has passed away now. But um, he wrote tester. I mean, he was troubled in many ways, but he was a fabulous writer. And he wrote test reports. And I remember there was one particular adventure that he wrote a test report about. And the test report was so much better written than the adventure game. And... He was very, very talented, and I, 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 when I set up in Hull, um, I, I asked him if he'd join, and he, he did, and that was great. Uh, obviously, Tony and Dave, um, who I'd approached beforehand and had written the prototype, we advertised for people, and a fellow called Steve Odes, who was quite local, um, was interested in animation, uh, and he came from, he was working as a clerk at Kalamazoo, and he was so talented. I, I mean, I, I don't know how we managed to find people like that, um, from Newcastle, um, Adam Tween um, had sent in some some, some work, um, absolutely inspirational pixel artist. And we pulled together the most extraordinary team of people. Um, we were very, very lucky. And uh, our first game, Lure of the Temptress, we came along really well uh, because we had such a great team. Uh, and it's broadly, you know, it was, it was being very well received by the press. Um, Mirasoft were very um, excited by it. Um, but the game still had whatever its um, working title was, you know, Vengeance or whatever. And I remember we, we were coming towards um, completion and the head of marketing was this woman called Alison Beasley. And she phoned up and she said, look, uh, we need to come up with a title. Can you send us some ideas? So I said a whole lot. And then at the bottom, I wrote, you're the temptress in brackets. This is just a joke. And she phoned me up and she said, we love the name Lure of the temptress. You have to call it Lure <laughs> of the temptress. And I said, look, Alison, honestly, there are two problems that I don't think there is a solution to. What are those problems? Well, I said, firstly, there's no luring. And secondly, there's no temptress. 
and there was a bit of silence. And then she said, could you put one in? So we were in a position where this game was almost finished and we had to reverse engineer it and add substantially to it so it could fit the name that marketing liked. And I and I was going to say as well, like that title um, on the Amiga, like Amiga would be used to getting some second rate ports, like stuff from the ST, but that really shined graphically and really was successful on that platform. I, I think people really appreciated that there was an actual really good adventure title point and click that was ah. essentially looking nice on the Amiga. Well, I think we, we we can thank Adam Tween for the backgrounds and and Steve Odes for for for, for the um, for the animation and and indeed Dave Cummins for the for the writing. I mean, I was writing the stories and I was doing the game design, but often you know you look at one person and clearly you know a great game is is, is created by a great team uh, and and I think it's disingenuous for people to you know to claim that they they are you know everything when they're not. But yeah, as I say, we had a great team and and Tony and Dave. I mean, Tony. Tony did a lot of, you know, thought about virtual theatre and how it might work and how it might work in the game. We were a very, very small team. I mean, the way that, to give you an idea of um, the way that it worked in those days is, to us, a network was um, a floppy disk. Dave was at one end of the room. Tony was the other. Uh, he would save something onto a floppy disk, eject it, and then use the Frisbee, you know, use the floppy disk as the Frisbee. Dave became <laughs> adept at catching it, plugging it in. And and that was the way that data was sent backwards and forwards between the two of them. Um, which They're again, hard to chuck as well. Floppy disks are really hard to throw. <laughs> not not if not if you do it like reverse, like a frisbee. If you throw it like a frisbee, actually, ah. they work quite well. You've got to get the backspin though. You've got to get the backspin. <laughs> and both Tony and Dave became really adept at catching these things. Um, and um, you know, a whole. However, I think there were one. I think it was just over a mega. Actually, you could get it on a floppy disk. So you know, there was an awful lot, but it felt like an awful lot in those days. David Gibbons as well um, was working. Uh, he'd done the Watchmen comic, and um, how did that kind of lead to Beneath a Steel Sky, which is just an absolutely beautiful title? I must say, <laughs> uh, we were all in awe of it when we were kids. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, when when I was at uh, at Activision. Um, I was part of the decision making for new projects, and um, I was talking to Rob Cousins, and Watchmen came up as as, as something that we we should explore. So um, I have no idea how I got hold of Dave Gibbons. Somebody must have given me a number, but anyway, I, I did. And Dave made it clear that he didn't actually own the rights. I think it was Dark Horse at that time that did. Um, but we kind of talked about video games, and he was he was fun. And uh, so after Lure of the Temptress. Uh, it I, I can't even remember, but I thought, well, this feels like it might be sort of comic booky in its the fact that it's futuristic and everything. And I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll see just if Dave would like to get involved. And to my absolute astonishment, he said he would. Um, and I mean, I was thrilled because he was he was a really really important part of the whole thing. Uh, and initially, it was just to sort of offer a little bit of advice from the side. Um, but then he got interested by, you know, how pixels would work. And we got him a copy of D-Paint and an Amiga. And he started designing the characters himself. Um, and, you know, he'd come up to, to Hull once once a month. And in those days, it was, a, it was fine up to Doncaster. But the trip from Doncaster to Hull was dreadful. They, they, and we still do have... But you know the, the, that that part of this this part of the world was dominated by by trains that are called sprinters, um, and sprinters have been produced by the bus department of British Leyland, which was our which was our main car company at the time, uh, a pretty dire bad car company I have to say. But um, you know the British government had decided that they wanted carriages on the cheap, so they approached British Leyland and said, "Can you turn a bus into a train?" And British Leyland said, yes, we can, and produced these dreadful things, um, which were bought in large numbers and, and and were shockingly embarrassing. You know, anybody who came to Hull would have to get on one of these things. And any sense that we were a proper company in a proper city, you know, doing proper things, was immediately lost by anybody who used public transport to come and see us. I remember the guys from um, Westwood, um, Brett Sperry, um, and a guy called Mike, who was the main designer for Command and Conquer um, and Karandia before that, you know, coming to see us. And it was just really embarrassing. Anyway, so Dave used to get on this bone rattling, terrible, terrible train. 
um, come to Searson Hull, and that was it was quite grim, but it was fun. But we were above in our in our little little studio, our little grim little studio. We were above a an arcade where you know lots of mothers smoking cigarettes would you know put put money into um, into fruit machines. But at the end of it was the best greasy little cafe counter where you could get really really greasy bacon butties. And for anybody who's listening to this who isn't English or not British, you probably need to know that a butty is like a it's 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 a sandwich but made with a really doughy bap, lots of cheap margarine and a really thick sliver of fatty bacon. And it's delicious. And if you're really, really naughty, then you'll put chips in with it as well. So it's a, a chip and bacon butty. And um, after this horrendous journey, you know, I take Dave uh, for, for, for bacon butty. And, you know, he loved it and we loved it. And he was terrific and incredibly um, enthusiastic um, you know, wonderful person to work with, but also an incredible name. So when we came, you know, when we finished the game and we published it through Virgin, uh, he tells the story of um, going with Daniel Woodyatt, uh, who was the head of PR. Um, and Dan- Danielle saying, you know, it's great that you're here, but, you know, this is the game. And, you know, if you can be nice to these people because they're really important, uh, bloody, 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 bloody. And she had no idea who he was. And so we arrived at Future <laughs> Publishing uh, in Bath. And, you know, she walked in and she was kind of wondering. And then suddenly from under their desks, everybody produced a copy watchman and asked him if he'd sign it. And she realized that she completely underestimated the, you know, the level of clout that he had amongst these journalists. That's really interesting because uh, Danielle Woodjack, she was um, Virgin Interactive and they were incredibly uh, kind of on it at that time so daniel for them woodyatt. to get daniel involved. woodyatt worked at us gold i'll tell you a wonderful story about daniel woodyatt um who da- uh, woody who's wonderful i mean she's just great but she was she started she was the friend of jeff brown's um wife called Anne brown so she came in as this incredibly gregarious receptionist um and everybody loved her um and uh well what happened is that um uh, she, she she came bounding in one day at US Gold, and everybody had gone to um, the Canaries for an off-site meeting, um, except me. And I said, but Woody, why did they not invite me? I'm the head of development. And um, I asked Tim Cheney why, why I hadn't been inv- invited. And he said, oh, you're technical. People wouldn't have understood you. And that was the <laughs> point. That was the point at which I phoned Rod Cousins back. And I said, uh, Rod, you know that I keep you know, telling you that I'm probably not interested in coming to um, Activision. Perhaps we should talk. <laughs> it was it was that one event. Um, but it, it was Woody, I remember telling me all about this incredible time they'd had in, in the Canaries. Um, and, and then being very embarrassed when she realized, you know, that, that, that I should have been invited too. But no, Woody was great. I mean, she was just, she, she was head of PR. And she was just like a, a whirlwind of energy. Um, just, you know, I loved, I loved working with all those Virgin people. Um, they did a fantastic job of kind of promoting beneath a steel sky, yes. and you know that time you were hitting thirty-two bit consoles, um, CD-ROM, and it had a talky soundtrack. Was that a lot of effort to kind of <laughs> get the talky soundtrack? We weren't the first, uh, because obviously the CD had just come out, as you say, um, CD thirty-two, of course. And the beginning of PC, PC was beginning to become a, a format that could be taken seriously. Um, and they asked me about whether I'd like to record voices. And it sounded like, sounded like a really nice idea. And I knew my, my sister's best friend was going out with an actor from the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, I would give you his name, but I won't because um, uh, it's rather an embarrassing story. So anyway, he said, well, look, I'll, I'll, um, I'll organize all these actors for you. That's fine. Royal Shakespeare Company, they'll be great. So um, we, we'd arranged it all. And I said, what about a studio? He said, I'll arrange it. My, my friend's got a place. It's not a studio, not quite a studio, but it's as good as. It'll be absolutely fine. So I turn up, and this friend's studio was his living room on Ballam High Street, which was fine until every couple of minutes, the bus, the 19 and the 249 <laughs> would go past, and everything would rattle. And... It was, it was just like, it was so disorganized. But that could have been fine 
except that he said, then said, I remember, to, to his friends, um, right, well, we'll break for lunch now. Um, who's coming to the pub? You, he said, I said, don't worry. He said, don't worry. I'll, I'll just, we'll, we won't have more than a couple of pints. Okay. You sure? You, you sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. So he comes back in and they've, they've had their th- probably three or four pints. And then he says, so lads, he wants to come upstairs for a smoke. Okay. This is surely not where you went. No, 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 no. This is the way that actors work. You know, it makes us better. It makes us more you know, expressive. Anyway, as you can imagine, it was a complete disaster because... You had the sober version. We had the sober the, version uh... and we had the stoned drunk version. And <laughs> we sent these, we put them into the game and sent it to, 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 to over to America where, you know, Virgin America was a publisher. And they came back and said, we can't understand a word of what's being said. <laughs> <laughs> These days, that would be added as bonus content. <laughs> it would, it would. So, so what happened, and, and I tell you what, our producer was somebody called Dan Marchant, and he spent, I think, four years in a row, his birthday, on his birthday, sleeping on our office floor, getting our games finished. Um, and, um, and, and another fellow called Mike Merrin. And, you know, we had our date that we were going to release it, and it just everybody had to just weigh in and cut these things up, this, this new recording, um, and getting it right. And you know, and and so we do have, and we almost certainly don't have the the, the rushes from the first recording. Um, but it was an absolute disaster. It was a disaster. And you know, thank goodness we you know we 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 were able to just start again and re-record from scratch. And it was kind of amazing the way that it worked. Like, um, I, I remember because it was just on like a one or two speed CD-ROM, wasn't it, as well? Yeah. So you'd have a, a slight delay before the sample would actually be loaded. But I, I remember just the personality of Joey in the game um, was just absolutely fantastic. Oh, I really enjoyed that as a kid. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, that's why, of course, and I'm sure we were going to come on to Beyond the Steel Sky. It was such a thrill to be able to go back and look at what, you know, try and try and try and replicate what people had loved the first time around and um, um, but then reinvent it for, 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 for modern audience thanks for listening to this week's show tune in next week for part two where we're going to be covering the broken sword series the da vinci code game and of course charles's new releases ciao